I kind of studied art at school, so I was very much interested in art. Always had an interest for fast cars and aeroplanes and things like that, but art was kind of my, uh, my hobby and what I was uh, sort of naturally uh, attended to, to go in that direction. Uh, so I was going to study fine art, and then I actually did it one summer when I was about 17, 18 years old, just concentrated on my art. Um, and realized that, uh, that I would probably go crazy if I just did art full time because uh, you're kind of a little bit in your own world, you're not really interacting very much with other people. So I sort of panicked and thought, what do I do? I can't do this. And then um, I kind of had lots of uh, advice from, from careers people. And I was lucky enough that my father was in education, so he was able to put me in contact with different people. And we looked at uh, things that I, uh, I was good at and did various tests and, and blah, blah, blah. And two jobs came out. One of them was a pilot and one of them was uh, a designer. And so I applied for both at the same time. I applied to be a, a, a jet pilot in the military and I applied to be a designer. And I found, when I was looking through design books, I found a, a small sketch of a car. I thought, and it was only then when I realized somebody actually designs cars. I'd never actually realized that people draw cars. You can actually get paid for drawing cars for a living. Um, so I applied for this university to study car design. It was the only university in England which does uh, car design. And I applied at the same time to, to join the RAF. And um, I said, whatever, whoever says yes first, I will do. So it was kind of a really spontaneous thing. And um, uh, like a week later, I already had one interview with the RAF and that was going well. I had a second one arranged. And then with the, um, uh, with the university with the, for car design, they rang me up two weeks later and said, uh, how much do you want to do it? And I said, oh, yeah, of course, a lot. I'm really excited. And they said, oh, sorry, but the course is full. Maybe you can do it next year. I said, uh, yeah, of course. All right, I'll, I'll do it next year. And, um, and then he said, well, actually, that was just a test. Um, you're on the course. It is full, but you're on. Um, and it was funny because I'd only sent some wildlife drawings. I'd done, I, I did animal illustrations, and I sent off a couple of paintings as well. So nothing to do with car design. Um, so then I joined a course of, of 70 guys who had known about this course of car design um, for years and years and I'd only just discovered it a few days ago and uh, it was a really, it was a big shock to the system because I'd come from being at school, being um, well known for, for being a good artist and um, being fairly successful at something and then I joined this course of, of car designers or wannabe car designers and I was the worst and it was a really I remember ringing up my um, my dad and saying, um, "I'm not. I, mean, I, I never give stuff up. I always, when I when I when I start something, I want to be the best. I'm very competitive and I want to um, succeed. But this was almost too much because the guys they were already on such a high level. Um, they'd studied car design before, actually. So, um, and for me, it was new. I didn't even know how to draw a car. I could draw a bird, but it wasn't very useful with car design." So I nearly gave it up. I remember ringing him up and saying, Dad, I'm not sure this is for me. You know, um, the level is so high and um, maybe, maybe, I've, uh, maybe I should uh, go back to just fine art. And he sort of said, stick with it, you know, see how it goes. Uh, it's early days. And, um, and I did. And, and it was really, I have to say, it was just hard work. Um, you have to be talented as an artist to be a car designer. Um, and, and now I actually teach car design as well. Um, so I really encourage students to be good drawers and that was what um, kind of got me through the initial stages that I just relied on my, my art skills, my drawing skills. I got offered a really nice um, work placement with, uh, with Rover, Land Rover at the time, which was then a very, very good placement to do. Um, and then when I got to see professional designers working, um, it kind of opened my eyes uh, and I really saw how they think how they explore different ideas, how they put them on paper, um, and then suddenly uh, I improved and, and kind of thought, yeah, maybe I can do this. When I was, just before I was about to, to study art, um, uh, I, I thought, actually, I'd like to be a racing driver. As naive and as stupid as that sounds, of course, now I'm a little bit more aware of, um, you know, a racing driver requires, but firstly, talent, which I didn't have, um, secondly, money. Uh, thirdly, they, it's their whole lives. I was 17 years old and thought, I'm going to be a racing driver. So I wrote to every Formula One team. It's so stupid now saying it, it's really embarrassing, but I did. And it was like, I wrote a letter explaining my passion for Formula One and could I please be a racing driver for your team? As silly as that sounds. Uh, and every, almost every team wrote back to me 
and I got 16 rejections. They all said, of course, no, you can't become a racing driver for us. But some of them offered different directions as to how I could get into Formula One, maybe by studying aerodynamics, you could become an engineer or a mechanic or something. So it was kind of interesting, but obviously um, I was very naive in doing that. But the, the sort of the irony of it all is that um, I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And as I mentioned, um, designed the SLS. And, um, and it was, it's funny because the SLS is the, is the car that leads the, the Formula One cars on the, on the first lap. And it's the safety car in Formula One. So every time there's an accident on the, on the TV, you see the SLS leading the pack. And it gives me quite a strange feeling to see a car which was a very, very personal project. I mean, it was a, a really, um, a really a special project to do and a privilege to be part of that project. And to see that car leading all the Formula One cars. And I actually wanted to be in one of those cars driving. And that, it's, it's kind of interesting how it kind of, um, yeah, swings and roundabouts everything in the end uh, yeah, works out somehow. And uh, interesting story anyway. So the design challenge of the, of the CLA was to create a compact four-door coupe. So if you could imagine, we've today got the CLS, which is our large four-door coupe. Um, and we wanted to create uh, almost like a baby brother of that car based on a, on a smaller platform, on a smaller package. Uh, we've actually got the same wheelbase as the A-Class. So the platform already existed, but we wanted to create a completely new car. So on paper, um, literally uh, something completely new, which is very rare for a designer to be able to do. Um, normally you have an existing car and you update that car. It's very rare that you get the chance to, to create something completely new from a white piece of paper. And that was the brief for that car. Um, the brief was to do something emotional, something that um, would attract new customers to the brand of Mercedes. So you have people who would maybe perceive Mercedes as um, more established, uh, safer looking cars or, or conservative cars, cars for, for older people. And the brief was really to attract new customers to the brand. People like, like ourselves, younger people, people who, who might normally go for another brand and then they, they're surprised because they're, they see that Mercedes come up with something unexpected, something that kind of um, is a little bit provocative. How I want people to react when they see this car is to look twice, is to not look at the car and then look away and look at other cars. When this car is in traffic, it should people should should stare at it a little bit longer than they would a normal car and not people who are necessarily interested in cars you know for me the success of a car is when a little kid smiles at the car and points at it when he's crossing the road and you're at the traffic lights or um, people who wouldn't necessarily buy car magazines or watch car programs um, I've seen uh, so I'm lucky enough to drive the car at the moment the CLA I have a CLA and it does get that reaction. When you're driving a car, people haven't seen something like this before. Uh, they look twice, they smile, they ask what it is when you stop at traffic lights, when you stop in a petrol station. And it's, it's that, um, that X factor. People don't know why they're looking twice, why they're staring at it. If you ask someone, why do you like it? They'll say, well, it looks good, but why does it look good? That's my job, to know why it looks good. Um, a lot of people, subconsciously appreciate things. So I don't, I don't expect people to appreciate the design and be able to explain why they do in detail. That's, um, that's a subconscious thing. I can explain why I think you like it and why um, um, what I did, or, or certainly the, the, the design ingredients on the car, why they create a, a more emotional statement. Um, and that can be explained in detail. But essentially what I want is that people just look at the car and go, wow, that's sexy, that's an attractive product. I would like to have it. Um, I, I got into car design because I, I'm very visual. I love sexy shapes. I lo I, we talked about Concorde earlier. Concorde makes me just go, wow, I get goose pimples when I see Concorde. It's the most beautiful, sexy shape in the world. Um, I like old uh, Porsches from the 80s with the, with the sexy wings on the form. I have one and I bought it because I love it. Um, when I drive it, I'm not even that impressed with how it drives. 
But when I get out of the car and I look at it, I think, wow, I'd love to drive it again. The, the ironic thing is that actually, I don't really want to drive it. I want to sit outside the car and just look at it. So it's that X factor, it's that, that desirability. I just want people to, to like it and to, to want to look at it. And that's the biggest compliment in the world. Design of the CLA was very much inspired from nature. Uh, we, look, we had a lot of inspirational images on the wall when we were doing an, our initial sketches um, and also when we went to the clay stage, when we went to 3D, um, we very much looked at the way wind sculpts sand, um, so sand dunes, how you get, you get um, in the desert you get these very very large sand dunes which are very soft and, and flowing, concave and convex shapes. And then, as the sand hits the top, as the sorry, as the wind hits the top of the sand dune, you get this very defined edge. So there's this sort of contrast between the soft, sculpted sand dunes and the defined edge, which the wind creates as it hits the top of the of the sand dune. And you can see that actually on the surfacing of the of the CLA. We did originally uh, introduce that sort of form language on the A class. We developed it on the CLA, so the CLA isn't exactly the same design. We have evolved the surfacing, we've created uh, slightly different sections in the bodywork of the car, but that inspiration came from nature, came from looking at images of sand dunes, of how um, the wind creates snow drifts and you get these very, very soft, very, very uh, beautiful forms and then this contrasting sharp edge that runs around them, that's why they look so special. Um, as I said before, just soft shapes uh, maybe looks initially interesting but lacks tension. But snow drifts, sand dunes, the way wind creates um, beautiful sculpture um, is very inspirational uh, for, for car design, for surfacing uh, on the car. Um, we look at nature, we look at animals, we look at the, I mentioned earlier, the eyes of the car, the headlights. We look at um, birds and the way they've got this sort of focused stare, this sort of uh, sense of aggression and purpose in, the, in their look. That's also something which is um, often used as a form of inspiration. Um, in terms of my personal inspiration, I'm inspired, I'm really a visual person. I cannot stop analyzing things and, and, and taking things in. I'm, I'm happy sat down on my balcony looking at the clouds. I can do it all afternoon. I don't need anything else. I'm just, I just read shapes and, and things. I, I'm, I've always been like that. So my experiences are what inspire me. Um, going out in an evening and having a fantastic night out puts me in a certain mood, which means that when I sit down and I sketch, the lines that I sketch are different to the lines that I would sketch if I'd been having a lazy week and not doing anything. Um, if I'm feeling sad or, or upset about something, sometimes I'll create some of the, the, the nicest shapes. So your mood, my mood inspires me. It, it, it's your, the lines that you create by moving your wrist on, the, on a bit of paper, they, they are different depending, or with me certainly different depending on what mood I, I'm in. Um, so emotions can inspire me. Um, as I said, nature is a massive form of inspiration. It sounds like a cliche. Um, that uh, yeah, a designer is inspired by the, by the eyes of an owl or something. Um, but it's not. Uh, I look at sharks. I'm hugely, hugely, hugely inspired by sharks. Recently I, did, um, I, did, I was lucky enough to do shark diving. Um, and when you see the shark in the water, and it's got such a timeless shape, such a, by timeless I mean so pure, so it moves effortlessly. A shark moves with, you don't see it flapping its fins or, or trying to go fast. It just glides through the, through the sea effortlessly. It's a timeless, pure shape. And it's not just round with no definition. It's got one crease running from the front of the nose to the rear to its tail. And that defines the shape of the shark. So the shark has structure, has definition. Um, has a direction in the water. But sharks inspire me, they're, they, they're, they're very much uh, a timeless, unique, uh, pure form that hasn't changed over thousands and thousands of years. And I think if you can translate some of those qualities into car design, you create shapes which are, which are, are pure, which um, will always be appreciated. Uh, and uh, 
Nature is a massive form of inspiration. Aircraft are also something which I am continuously amazed by when I see aircraft. And the ironic thing is that nature and aircraft, both of them aren't designed. Nature is something which evolves over time, which is nothing designed by humans. Aeroplanes, they're not designed, um, or let's say they're not styled. They're, they're engineering led, they're, they're created by aerodynamicists in a wind tunnel, yet they're some of the most beautiful designs that we have. If you look at Concorde, even if someone was to produce Concorde now, it would look modern, it would look from another planet. Um, it's beautiful and it's, it, it looks initially very simple, but if you look at the section of the wings, they've got a flow like a bird. When you see a bird just gliding, the wings are not straight, they've got curvature, very subtle curvature, which, which do lots of little subtle tricks to the air to keep that bird in the air. If you look at the wings of Concorde, they're not just a triangle, they've got subtle shape. They, 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 they fall like the, the feathers of a bird when it's gliding. Um, and that, that's a sort of, that adds to the beauty of it. So it's a simple shape with beautifully executed surfaces, but no stylist produced that aeroplane. No stylist drew it and thought, that's a sexy plane, let's make it like that. It was created by aerodynamicists in a wind tunnel. I was lucky enough to go to a museum where I saw all the prototypes of Concorde before it was the final design. And it's really interesting when you look at them that the final design, which was the most efficient design um, and the fastest design, was by far the sexiest design, by far. They were very awkward shapes, very forced uh, shapes that, that didn't have a natural flow to them. And yet Concorde, the final thing that came out, was by far the most attractive, beautiful design. And that is an inspiration for me. And not just on one car, that will always inspire me. I will always fall back on, the, on nature, on sharks, on aeroplanes, on aircraft, on uh, my stomach, which is creating noise. Um, yeah, but they're a massive form of inspiration. I'm very, very visual. Sports cars, other car companies inspire me. I've got massive respect for what our competitors do. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong in saying that. Some, some of our competitor cars look fantastic, but then I, look, why, then I question why do they look fantastic? Can I learn something from that? Can we reinterpret things that we see? So anything that I look at inspires me. Conversations inspire me, moods inspire me, the weather inspires me, the shapes of clouds, landscapes are incredibly inspiring. Um, everything. I, I'm really like a sponge visually and, and personally I, I yeah, I, there's nothing that doesn't inspire me. But there's certain things that I always fall back on. A cat, a big cat, a lion, the way it's got this confident walk when it's, when it's stalking its prey and it's focused stare and its head doesn't move. It's a focused stare. That tension in the body to create, to, to make the, the head so still and yet this whole body is moving. If you can create that sort of tension in a car, you create a car that's ready to explode. If you see a supercar, on the road, you often won't see a supercar being driven fast. You'll see cheaper, smaller cars being driven fast, but a, a supercar won't. And the reason is, it's almost like a shark or like a lion, because they don't have to. Because 99% of the time, they're relaxed, they're easygoing, they don't need to. But when they want to, they explode and they get their prey. They get what they want because they can do it. Um, and that sort of quality of being so sure of yourself, so self-sure and so, um, you, you, so powerful, but you don't have to, to um, express it all the time. The, 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 the way you look shows, communicates to other people, you are powerful. I want people to look at the CLA and realize that it's something different, something unique that they haven't seen before. Ultimately, something good looking, something desirable, where they go, wow. If, I can if, if, pe if I'm driving the car and people look twice at the car, um, then it gives me a good feeling. You can tell if someone's impressed or not. And I think, I, think I, I just want that simplest of reactions, that people look at it and go, wow, that's a bit different. That's and then they look at it again and that looks good. That looks good and it makes you want it more. When you like the way something looks, you want to like it more. Um, your emotional connection is already there. 
Um, and that's a big part of, the, of selling something is that X factor, that wow factor. And I want that. I want people to walk by and look twice. Maybe they weren't even going to go for that car. Maybe they were going to buy something else. And they see it driving by or they see it in the window of a dealership and they go, wow, that looks different. That's a bit unexpected. That's, look at the, the surfaces. They, they might not even know why. I don't expect people to appreciate it on an intellectual level, but just to go, wow, that's, that's cool. I, I really like that. Maybe I should have a test drive and see if I can, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I can get one of those or something. I just want that feeling, that kind of, fascination and if they can if if, if I can cap if people can have that uh, reaction then I think we've succeeded in the design of the car certainly I fit in the target market for this car I'm maybe one of the younger buyers but it's certainly aimed at attracting younger customers um, people that wouldn't necessarily um, go for a Mercedes as, as their first car but not exclusively that, it should also appeal to other people. It's not a polarizing car in the sense that only people that would have gone for other brands will go for it, or only young people. Uh, I think it's wrong to be too narrow-minded in your target market. Why I think it appeals to, um, to new buyers, to younger people like myself, um, is because it has the ingredients of what we aspire to, in a Mercedes, we aspire to the sort of the, the, the authority and the status of a Mercedes, the image of a Mercedes, and it certainly has that. You, you see the face of the car from a distance and you know it's a Mercedes coming towards you. So it clearly has the Mercedes identity, um, but it has something new as well, that it's a car that can fulfill many different qualities. You can, you can drive this car for fun. It's a dynamic car to drive. It is a sporty car to drive. You can drive it in a relaxed manner, it's quiet, it's luxurious. You can pull outside a, an expensive hotel and you will, it will look special. It will look as special as cars twice its value. Um, you can be in traffic and, and have the wow factor. Um, or you can drive calmly and serenely and being, be, be, have the feeling that you're in something very elegant. Um, you've got the Mercedes face on the front of the car with a, with a central star. People see the car from a distance and it's that sort of respect, it's a Mercedes. So I think, I think it's, um, it's that the car is very dynamic, you can't put it in a corner and label it as one thing. And I think that's why um, it's, it's a car which can really appeal to a wide range of people and also to, to people that maybe before wouldn't have considered a Mercedes because there didn't exist a product within the brand that appealed to them. And now that car, the, the CLA, has those qualities that maybe before they had in other car companies. Now they've got it in a, in a brand new, exciting product, which is a Mercedes, which doesn't exist anywhere else in the, in the car market. There is nothing like it, it's unique. So you're buying something exclusive, but you're buying something which is dynamic, which can fulfill different roles. The best or nothing is a very powerful statement to make and you can very easily lose by making such a statement. I see, it, I see the positives of that statement as our goal is to make the best cars and what a brilliant um, aim to have. What a, what a great thing that we're trying to achieve. What a difficult thing that we're trying to achieve. My goal as a designer is to make the most attractive cars. I want other designers from other companies coming up to me on the Standard and Motor Show and saying, really respect, it looks good you've done a really good job and that feeling is fantastic. The best or nothing is a, is a strong statement, it's a very powerful statement. You can live or die by this statement, um, it's, it's dangerous, but um, what's good about it is that it focuses everyone's um, attention on achieving the, um, a, one goal, the best. Look at the benchmark competition, where are they best, better than us and let's be better than them in that area and keep on and keep on and it keeps us on our toes. Thank you.